Council City Council, uh, Adam Clark, who's the Deputy City Mayor, Mayor at Leicester, um, he covers environment and transport. From Leeds, we've got David Ellis, um, who's a team leader, transport planning um, at Leeds City Council. And uh, from Oxford City Council, we've got Emily Kerr. Um, we're, the speakers are going to um, speak for about eight minutes each, and that should leave us some time for Q&A. If you have questions, could you put them in the Q&A &A box, not the, um, not the chat box, because um, our team helping me here today can't... Um, uh, uh, it's too difficult to deal with both sets and somehow they've got to get the questions to me as well. So um, I'll, I'll go straight to to, to Jane, uh, um, who's a cabinet member in Newcastle City Council. Hi, Jane, and thank you so much for coming today. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, I have to leave quite quickly, so I'm just going to speak fairly briefly and then leave some space in my slot if anybody wants to ask me questions at that point. So the aim for Newcastle is that everybody who lives, works in, works in or visits Newcastle uses active travel for some of their journeys. So it's either part of their journey or some journeys are made by active travel. We're helped in our ambition by the fact that Newcastle is a compact city, so it's quite easy to get around using active travel. And we have a fairly good public transport, transport network, so it's possible for people to make modal shifts for many of their journeys. We also face challenges, as everybody does. So the physical constraints is that we do have hills in the city. We have narrow streets, a lot of them built in the Victorian era. So there's limited space. And that is a constant challenge as to how you make fair use of the space. And that the west of the city is on the other side of the A1. So there's problems in connectivity there. We've also got social constraints, as everybody does. So people are under pressure. If we're asking them to make changes, we can be increasing pressure. I think this is one that comes up particularly around the school run and school streets idea. If people have already got limited time and we're asking to take more time out of a difficult day, it can be very challenging. We're also quickly, acutely aware that some people face more barriers to change than others. So if we are talking about cycling, ability to actually be able to afford a bike, to, to keep it securely, to have the skills to use a bike. There's also concerns about safety. So we have to find more ways where we to get women and people from our BAME communities cycling and active travel. And we, some research that we did suggested that there were quite a lot of people within those groups that would like to cycle or walk more often, but didn't feel that we were able to. The other social constraint we have is that um, there's still a perception that active travel is around cycling and a certain kind of cycling, I would say, that so it's something that you should only do if you're super fit with the latest bike. So helping people understand what active travel means is important to us. We have had um, quite a lot of, of success. So we're one of the highest recipients of active travel funding, which reflects the, you know, the fact that we put in good bids from an expert team. I suppose the, the downside to that is when you're funding through funding pots, you're often ending up having to do projects rather than an overarching approach, which obviously would be the ambition. And ideally, we'd be in a position where we would be linking all of this into what we were doing with public transport as a whole. We're um, developing, we've had some success in developing new routes, which I think is important because that makes the, it, being actually able to develop a route makes it helps people make a significant change. So for example, we've now got a cycling route to one of our major hospitals. So we've got a quite a success in change in terms of the um, people who work there being able to do things differently. We're rolling out a school streets programme, which certainly the ones that we've done so far have been very successful and well received by the schools and parents. We're reducing traffic through neighbourhoods, so we're taking of a pro an approach of two not through, which we hope will may encourage people to do those modal shifts on short journeys and also <coughs> make something just a lot more attractive and and pleasant to walk through neighbourhoods. We've also been part of the e-scooter pilot, and I suppose that's an interesting question about how e-scooters can fit within active travel. It has presented some challenges, but there are also opportunities there in terms of how it can fit into being part of rethinking journeys. So there may be some scooting, some walking, some use of public transport as opposed to using a car. So that's a, a brief snapshot of what where we are. Um, so if you have any questions. Okay, we got any questions? 
Um, are you going to? Um, no questions yet. No, any any questions? Any? Yeah. Oh, um, uh, Fabian Hamilton, yeah. who I should have introduced at the moment, who's uh, at the beginning, who's the uh, treasurer um, of the APPG, and obviously is a Leeds MP. And welcome, Fabian. Thank you. Your question. Truth. Um, Councillor Byrne, um, thank you for that introduction. I, I know Newcastle a little bit. It's not too far from Leeds. Mm. Uh, it's, near, it's near, nearer to Leeds than London anyway. Um, and my daughter went there to university. One of the things that puts a lot of people off, as you rightly said, was this safety issue. And I wondered whether your local authority is working on segregated cycleways, because it's, it's, all, it's very important to have safe routes, but actually when they're segregated from traffic, people do feel a little safer. The problem with that, as I found just this afternoon on my way to uh, Leeds Station to come down to London, is that actually uh, those segregated routes are sometimes used for vans and lorries as a sort of car park off the road. So I wondered how you, if you've got them, and if you and and uh, how you then enforce uh, the fact that that vehicles aren't allowed to cross over into them, because that then increases the idea of safety uh, for those who aren't very expert. Mm -hmm. I think a segregated routes are it's a big challenge for us because I mentioned at the beginning about the width of some of our streets. So it's how you can provide routes that are connected, but also have the space, where, you know, what works in different spaces. So the route I mentioned going to one of the major hospitals, the RVI, will have a set, it's got a temporary route at the minute that we developed during COVID, but it will have a segregated route and it will have a, a raised curb, which could, it should increase in terms of safety. In terms of use by other vehicles, then that comes back to our you know, powers of our moving vehicle enforcement. Certainly it is a challenge. There is a challenge with advisory cycle routes that you often get people parking over them. So I would say it's 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 an ongoing issue and there's no there's no obvious answer either because in another one of our neighborhoods, high streets, we've got people who said they would like to have a segregated route on the high street and they would like to cycle there. We've got other people saying that they actually feel more confident and safe cycling on a quiet route. So that even if they had a segregated route, but it was beside traffic. So if anybody comes up with the answer, I'd be uh, delighted to hear it. But I think what we find at the moment, it's just trying to find different solutions for different areas and building up people's confidence and sense of safety as we go. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jane. Um, we've had a question in, uh, which is, how has the e-scooter pilot contributed to modal shifts? Uh, and, and what are the, the council's thoughts on moving forward with e-scooters? Well, well, there is some evidence that it's contributed to modal shift. I mean, some in terms of people commuting via e-scooter rather than cars. We haven't maybe seen as much connection to using e-scooters to then use public transport. So that's something we'd be looking ahead to. We've got, as, uh, as your colleague mentioned, quite a high student population. So we've got some evidence of that, uh, of e-scooters being used in pre preference to taxis as well. So I think there's some interesting evidence there. There are also some challenges in terms of use of e-scooters and the use on the pavements. But what we're looking to do is to whether we can continue with the pilots building in some more some more safeguards around some of the concerns about e-scooter usage and maybe directing it more to being used to, for commuting. Okay, thank you. And I think we've, had, we've got one more question, which I think is all we've got time for um, before you have to go, Jane. So the question is, is, which is a really important question, what data are you collecting, and I think how are you collecting it, uh, to monitor the number and frequency of people walking and cycling across the city? Well, we'd have to look at a range of data sources. So we do have some actual monitoring in terms of use of, of cycle routes, but some of that would have to be around surveys and talking to the population because we don't obviously monitor everybody as they're walking around. I would say a lot of it is on a project base as well. So if we're looking at a school street, it's able as part of the ETRO that we do on a school street to do a monitoring over months to see what the difference is. Well, it's, it's very important that you actually find some, you know, some data rather than anecdotes as to how things change. OK, and, and hopefully the other speakers have also picked up those two questions on e-scooters and, and collecting data and, and may want to um, pick them up in, in their, in their uh, contribution. Thank you so much, Jane. That's, that's really useful and 
obviously people can find you at uh, Newcastle City Council if they've got any further uh, questions uh, for you. Thank you so much and, you know, do stay as long as you can. Um, and um, my colleague Daniel Zeichner, who's the MP for uh, Cambridge, has just joined but can't stay for very long. Uh, I also have a couple of staff members from Mike Kane's office. Uh, he's the uh, one of uh, the shadow minister on the Labour team for uh, active travel and... From office. Oh, sorry, and George is from uh, Guy Oppenheim's office, uh, as a Conservative uh, member of the, of this of, of the APPG. Um, so thank you. Um, we now move to so um, yeah, thank you very much, Jane. We now move to Adam Clark, who's a Deputy City Mayor, Mayor for Environment and Transportation, uh, Leicester City Council. Um, over to you, Adam. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for inviting me to talk today. Um, a little bit about me, I've been uh, responsible for active travel in Leicester since 2015, a councillor since 2011. I cycle and walk and live by my own rule of no unnecessary car trips. Um, a little bit about Leicester. Um, Leicester's got a population of um, 370,000 um, within its administrative area, um, but that pretty much doubles if you look at the urban area. Um, like most cities, a quarter of our emissions come from, our carbon emissions come from transport, and a quarter of all car journeys in the city are under two kilometres. The average trip is only five kilometres and around a third of emissions are from journeys um, of less than five miles long. Therefore, um, a great swathe of journeys are cyclable and walkable, but are unfortunately taken by uh, the private motor car. 80% um, of our nitrogen dioxide is produced by road transport, um, and half of our residents have told us that they are concerned about air quality. Leicester is one of the fastest growing cities in the country with a 13% increase predicted between uh, 2016 and 2036. Over 100,000 residents live within a 10 uh, minute cycle ride um, from the city centre. So our vision for transport, um, which is the exam question, is for a carbon neutral, growing, healthy, accessible and connected city with the cleanest air possible. Our vision seeks to support a high quality of life uh, through high quality travel to help us to get to net zero, to accommodate growth and to improve health outcomes. Now, to achieve this, we do need funding mechanisms aimed at creating what the Americans call transport equity. Um, we need to rebalance how people move around cities in favour of healthier, more sustainable and more affordable modes. Um, you may have read about our recent workplace parking levy consultation. Um, we, are, we have been looking at that. The jury is currently out, but whatever we decide in the coming days and weeks, the vision will remain the same. Some principles. We believe cars should only be for necessary trips and active transport, cycling and walking needs to be the first choice for shorter journeys. For most people, um, it's not a nice to do. Uh, recreating the city to maximise public and active travel is as beneficial for those that need to use a private car as it is to those using sustainable, more sustainable modes. Our transport policies are developed through the prism of the climate emergency, um, recognising those vast co-benefits that climate action brings, such as tackling congestion, which is a drag on local economies and our local economy. Even if we wanted to in Leicester, um, if we want, even if we wanted to, there is a limited ability to extend our road network. Um, I'm in agreement with the campaign for better transport and other research that shows that by increasing road capacity you just create uh, more demand um, and, and that supply to demand is something that you can't build out by introducing more cars and this creates more congestion more cost more carbon emissions uh, more damage to our health um, which can be improved in turn by active travel um, so in terms of health life expectancy in our city is lower than the England average and the gap between the more deprived and more affluent communities um, is growing too. A lack of physical exercise is one of the major factors that contribute to health inequalities in the city, like all cities, and persuading people to cycle and walk more um, can obviously help significantly. Um, so what we want to do is to 
build on our successful pedestrianisation of our um, city centre. It's the biggest um, pedestrianised city centre that allows cyclists in the country. We're building on the Connecting Leicester programme, which was initiated by our directly elected mayor um, when he was first elected in 2011. And that's being followed by the Transforming Cities programme that's uh, currently um, being worked through. And that's enabled us to start to move from the hub of the city centre um, and develop the spokes of our commuter corridors in terms of cycling and walking infrastructure. We also want to accelerate the cycling and walking improvements that followed um, the COVID-19 um, pandemic um, and our COVID-19 transport recovery plan. We delivered the first pop-up cycle lane, which we dubbed the Key Worker Corridor, which served um, the Leicester Royal Infirmary, and 11 miles of cycling and walking pop-up infrastructure within 10 weeks. Now, much of that will become permanent, we hope, funding um, permitting. We want to accelerate work to remove traffic from our neighbourhoods, those low traffic neighbourhoods, those school streets. We delivered low traffic neighbourhoods in the 1980s and we've got three experimental schemes currently on the ground. Um, and we also want to continue our 20 mile an hour zone rollout, which also promotes cycling and walking. And that's now covering great swathes of our city, but there's still more to do. Yeah. And we also need to improve our cycle parking, both in neighbourhoods, um, in employment areas and in the city centre. We've embraced um, Paris's 15 minute city concept to pump prime healthier neighborhoods, to connect local services so that people are within a short walkable or cyclable distance from local services. Um, and we want people to be able to get from neighborhood to neighborhood as well as connect to the city center. We want to build and continue on our relationship with charities like Sustrans, with bikeability, with living streets to deliver behavior change and deliver smart tech opportunities. We want to build confidence and what's known as a propensity to cycle. We also would love to grow our Santander cycle scheme, the largest um, solely e-bike share um, opportunity in the country. And I think in terms of cities, we're crucial in terms of um, the challenges we face helps to drive innovation. Um, and people should look to, to um, archetypal cities like those cities that are represented here today, because um, we can help meet the, those great um, challenges. Um, so one of the huge challenges, as I mentioned from, from Newcastle, is that it's space. We don't have the space that they've got in, in Rotterdam um, that I visited recently. Um, we do have a, an abundance of wonderful street trees, um, but they create a challenge when you want to put in a three metre um, bi-directional cycle lane. And we've also got an underground services network, which is mysterious and, and often unknown and creates huge challenges in terms of when you're costing up schemes. Um, so where you don't have the luxury of space, you do have to innovate and think very creatively. And I think that's what cities like Leicester and those represented here do very well. Our decision-making processes, just to conclude, are based on uh, obviously government um, policy guidance and law. LTN 120 um, is, is crucial, and, and, and you know I'm really keen on pushing LTN 120 and our, uh, to our officers and making the pip squeak on that. Um, but also we have our own street design guide, which um, has the healthy streets methodology at its core, which gives clarity about the purpose of streets through a, a typology of nine street types that we've developed. Um, in in Leicester um, but I was rather taken on a recent trip as I said to Rotterdam where um, the Dutch cycling embassy talked about two street types um, stay streets and flow streets flow streets um, help people get from one place to somewhere else and stay streets are somewhere in their own right not just um, not just a conduit to somewhere else they are somewhere um, and I think that cities like Leicester need many more stay streets thank you Thank you very much, Adam. Okay. Um, th th yeah, thanks very much, um, Adam. Um, did you say Emily asked you? No, oh, Adam, do you have to leave early? Or, or I'm like, I, I can hang around. To... You can hang around. That's great. Brilliant. So what I'll do is I'll go straight um, on to uh, David from Leeds and then, and then Emily from Oxford, and hopefully we'll have time for Q&A after that. So thank you so much to um, Adam, uh, Councilor Adam Clark from Leeds, Leicester City Council. Now I'll go on to David Ellis, um, who's a team leader of transport planning at Leeds City Council and is our first officer speaking today. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm just sharing my screen now. Has that, has that come through for everyone yeah, on the call in the room? Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So I'm just going to give myself a timer.
Yeah, so yeah, as I've been introduced, I'm David Ellis. I'm a team leader in transport planning at Leeds City Council. And it's really a pleasure to, to uh, join this meeting today to explain our active travel ambitions in the city of Leeds. Um, so we've got a very simple tagline for our Connecting Leeds Transport Strategy, which is for Leeds to become a city where you don't need a car. Um, now, a city where you don't need a car is a significant change for a city like Leeds, which once styled itself as the motorway city of the 70s and is still um, influenced in many ways by that era in terms of its, its built environment. And we recognise there's a lot of work to do um, to achieve this vision. Um, but we believe this is the change the city needs to make uh, to deliver our goals around the climate emergency, around health and well-being, around inclusive growth and also around the cost of living. Um, and to make Leeds a city where you don't need a car, we see active travellers playing a fundamental role, um, as well as, co of course, as, as public transport. Um, so just to start with some basic um, sort of high-level targets, um, in order to achieve this goal, we need to significantly grow the share, um, the, the modal share of, of walking and cycling, the, the two key active modes. Um, and we've got particularly significant ambitions in cycling. We want the proportion of trips that are cycled to increase by 400% um, from 1% as they were in 2017 uh, to 4% of all trips. And we also we want to grow uh, trips made by, by foot, uh, pedestrian trips by 33%. Um, so from rising from 25% of all trips to 31% of all trips. And then the, the kind of other side of the coin is that we actually want to reduce the proportion of trips that are made by car um, down from a majority, a significant majority of 61% in 2017, down to 41% um, to a, by 2030. I should say that's, that's, the, that's the end goal, which is a, a sort of a medium term end goal really for all these, all these changes. Um, and actually having a goal of reducing car uh, trips is um, it's probably not the first time a city has done this, but it's quite significant for us because it allows us to justify reallocating space uh, from from the car to other modes, so we're not we're not we're not necessarily trying to even sustain current levels of car use. We're actually trying to reduce it, and that that kind of it's not a, a, a panacea a panacea, but it it does help with the, the space problem because it means we don't have we don't have to widen uh, junctions and roads quite as much when we're um, delivering uh, active travel infrastructure. We can actually uh, take take space from the car to some extent. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about six areas very quickly um, that we're working on to deliver this, this quite ambitious uh, uh, set of goals and to make leaders say that where well, you don't need a car, um, some of which have already been touched upon. So I'm going to look at active travel neighbourhoods, I'm going to look at protected cycling infrastructure, um, our work on 20-minute neighbourhoods, Vision Zero, a brief look at the city centre, and also um, how we make our design inclusive. Um, and this to, so to start with the issue that Fabian picked up on, um, on all of our major radial and orbital corridors, we want to deliver protected cycle infrastructure, um, which is often the most challenging kind of plank of this, um, of this set of, of interventions. Uh, we actually started doing this in 2014 with the, the City Connect route between Bradford and East Leeds, which, which Fabian may have cycled down today. Um, and we've built on this success with other uh, radial routes in, in South Leeds on Elland Road and Dewsbury Road. Um, we also, in the pandemic, used some of the emergency active travel funding to deliver lightly segregated schemes in a number of areas, including on the, the main corridor near the, near the university. And we're actually now developing that into a permanent scheme. Um, We've generally found, though, that light segregation has been quite successful at making cyclists feel safer on lengths, um, but it's harder to deliver safe junctions using temporary measures. So we're, we're finding that we're focusing our investment on, on permanent measures on, on, on junctions um, uh, in, 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 in our forthcoming schemes. Um, there's also another interesting point, that, which is that cycle design standards, you know, very encouragingly have, have, have improved and been expanded over recent years, particularly with LTM 120. So we, we may be revisiting certain of our earlier schemes to try and raise the, raise the standard of, of design um, to make sure they're fully compliant. Um, so a second area of work um, is what we call active travel neighbourhoods, more commonly known across the country as low traffic neighbourhoods or LTNs, but for us they're ATNs. Um, both good names, but I guess our name uh, for them emphasises that we're trying to promote active travel um, through measures like modal filters um, and, and 
and pocket parks. We've got a number of trial LTNs in progress and we're developing more. Um, and I think as a lot of local authorities have found kind of really intensive consultation with stakeholders is really key to success here. Yeah. So we, we have some of our extant L ATNs we've, we've already made modifications to. And for some of the ones that are forthcoming, we've done some really detailed um, work kind of doing kind of co-design of, of the network of, mo of metal fillers with residents to look at different options for filtering streets and um, just to really ensure we've got that, that buy-in um, at the outset. Um, because as our first speaker mentioned, it, is, it can result in, in quite a significant change to, to people's uh, neighbourhoods and lives. But changes that we think are really be beneficial, and you can see here how we're, we're looking to incorporate landscaping and, and, and greening into, into these measures. Um, moving on to the, the third area, that's the Leeds City Centre. So I think as I, um, we heard from, from Leicester, the city, the city centres are where we can really drive growth in, in, in active modes. Often they're the easiest place to walk or cycle to in theory, and, and certainly the easiest place to walk and cycle around. Although the legacy of, of recent decades means that often there are many barriers to that, usually in terms of infrastructure and, 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 and um, volumes of motor traffic. We have in, in the last sort of two or three years, we've uh, implemented a lot of schemes um, using infrastructure for sustainable transport to develop new cycle tracks, new pedestrianised spaces. We've also widened footways quite substantially across Leeds City Centre and created a lot of new crossings and wider crossings. So quite, quite you know, traditional or becoming traditional interventions, um, but we've, we've done that at, at quite a rapid pace um, with a, a large funding programme that we received from the DFT. Um, we've also got a major scheme ongoing at the moment to remove through traffic um, from the heart of the city at City Square near the railway station. And we're building into that scheme lots of new uh, segregated cycle infrastructure and sig uh, significantly enhanced walking uh, links. And looking ahead, we've found that we, although we've, we've worked at pace over the last year, few years, but there are quite a lot of gaps in the network. And there's that, often that problem people say, oh, it's got a great infrastructure, but it doesn't quite get me to where I need to go. So we're developing a kind of holistic plan to fill the gaps in our city centre network so that you can cycle both across and around the city centre. And that means the city centre itself isn't a barrier to trips between neighbourhoods. Um, and it's and it's also possible to cycle across it, then we hope, without sharing with, with either cars or with buses, which can also be a barrier for many uh, prospective cyclists. Another major area of work is on inclusive, making sure our design for cycling is inclusive, I think LTM 120 has been really clear on this, but we, we've got a long history in Liz of working with uh, disabled groups and access groups to ensure that things like curb up stands and service treatments are, are accessible and legible to all our users and that our cycle infrastructure is accessible to all, all types of cycle and that we don't inadvertently create barriers to certain user groups. Um, and we, we're doing this both with site visits with groups before we, we build schemes, but also getting going uh, with groups to schemes after they've been built to get um, important feedback and that's another really important area to make sure that there's there's consensus across the whole community um, on, on 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 these changes um, so that's an important area um, just jumping on to uh, an, another plank that we're, we're developing in Leeds the nature of the 20 minute neighborhood so a bit a slightly larger uh, the the um, kind of area perhaps the 15 or 10 minute neighborhood but we've settled on 20 this is a quite a new area of work so I've not really got many details here but we're looking at how we can deliver this concept across a, a large uh, city such as Leeds. Uh, we've just been consulting on the sorts of services and facilities people would like to see in a 20 minute neighborhood. Um, we, we're going to incorporate school, uh, we've got some existing school streets, we want to incorporate routes to schools and routes to district centers into this work. And um, so that's, that's an exciting emerging field. Um, and then most recently of all, we've recently adopted a vision zero strategy, uh, which commits us to eliminating all deaths and serious collisions uh, related to uh, the roads in Leeds by 2040. And to, to achieve this, we're going to make everyone who's got any responsibility for making decisions around highways responsible um, for the safety of all road users. Um, and whilst that is a, a positive goal in and of itself, it will also, we, we, we hope, make walking and cycling more attractive. Um, and it really ties together some of the other threads that I've talked about around infrastructure and around um, active travel neighbourhoods. Um, so yeah, just coming to the end now, what I'd, um, what I'd like to conclude on is saying that we are really excited about the future of active travel in Leeds. We've made a lot of progress in the last few years. And I work with a number of colleagues who are really passionate about creating a better environment for walking and cycling. And I think our decision makers have set a, a, um, have provided us with a really bold and radical vision for 
what they want to see. What I would say, and maybe on more of a net of caution, is that I think with present levels of funding, it will take us a long time to deliver this vision. Um, so we, we, we think we probably need a, a, something like a tenfold increase in funding if we're to deliver the vision in, in a reasonable time scale. Um, and we'd note that kind of active travel spending is still lower than spending on, on kind of general highways. Um, but to end an optimistic note, as I've, as I've said, in recent years, with the launch of Active Travel England, the Active Travel Funds and LTO 120 really has given us a morale boost in the active travel field and has been really helped us to deliver high, high quality facilities on the ground. So we hope this, this trend in national policy continues, um, though maybe at an accelerated pace. Uh, and I will leave it there as I think I'm, I'm on 10 Thank minutes. You. Thank you so much, David. There is a question coming for you, but I think I'll, I'll let um, uh, Emily Kerr from Sure. Yes, we'll come in and, and hopefully we'll have time certainly for that question and maybe one or two others. Could I please remind any, uh, anybody with a question to put it in the Q&A rather than the chat? Um, OK, so uh, I've got uh, Emily Kerr. Kerr um, uh, I'm flexible. Kerr is, Kerr is great. Kerr, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. OK. And uh, Green Party councillor from Oxford. And are you... Um, do you have a, a, a hold a poster? Or a, a, a... Uh, no, no, I am just uh, very interested in active travel and advocate for it across both councils. Yeah, of course, because you're two-tier, um, exactly. which in itself is a challenge. So over to you, uh, Emily. Great. And actually, I'm going to start on that note. So I just wanted to emphasize that transforming our transport in Oxford is truly cross-party and cross-council and cross-stakeholders. You know, we're, we're all involved in this. We've historically had a Conservative council in Oxfordshire, which is the Transport Authority. Uh, they've launched a lot of the initiatives that are now being seen through by a, a rainbow coalition. Um, and, and both councils work with the both universities colleges, businesses, bus companies, network rail in, in designing our vision for the future of Oxford. And I'm sure that's true for the other speakers that have spoken as well, but just with the, the change of administration, um, it's it's been particularly obvious um, where we are. But, but as I say, it is truly cross-party the way that we work here. So our vision then, well, like the other speakers, it's of a clean green Oxford, you know, with improved public health. Um, and uh, our vice chancellor, from Oxford was quoted last earlier this month saying, you know, she was imagining our future student arriving by bicycle on one of the car free routes from Osney to Ifley, from Cowley to Cumnor. And, and I think this summarises, you know, where we want to go. We want to shift um, to having uh, a beautifully designed public spaces with space for trees and people, not just cars. We want to have a cycling and walking network, which is as good as the best in Europe, which means that people can get around safely, healthily and cheaply uh, for all residents and visitors. Uh, again, 20 minute neighbourhoods have been referenced, you know, this means clean air, everyone being able to access local facilities, uh, sociable residential streets which have community, not cars, uh, and we want a carbon neutral flagship bus transport system for our city which is aiming to be carbon neutral. Uh, and finally, the aim is that all of this will lead to a significant reduction in congestion so that essential vehicles and people that have to drive uh, have reduced journey time because Oxford, like some of the other cities is mentioned, is a small, constrained, medieval city with narrow roads. There simply isn't space to just build another lane. And as we uh, know from looking at uh, analogue cities across the world, building another lane doesn't work. We have to shift the way that we do this. Um, so that's our vision. How are we going to do it? Well, we've got clear targets to cut car journeys, decarbonise and have safer cycling and walking. And I think here on the left hand side, these are kind of the key goals. We are aiming to reduce a quarter of car trips by 2030, 50 percent by 2040. And that is county wide. It's not just within the city. So probably the city needs to take more of its fair share than this. Uh, we're aiming to have a net zero transport system by 2040. And as Leeds have just alluded to, we're aiming to be vision zero by 2050, although I like their 10 year earlier aim. So, you know, that that's strong and that means zero deaths we've had three women tragically killed on bicycles by hgvs in oxford in the last two years it has to stop um you know it's 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 hugely distressing to all of us that they're in this city um that's the left hand side uh, the, the middle column then um is our transport hierarchy so we want to prioritize these modes of transport so first we want it to be walking and wheeling and then cycling and riding uh then public transport motorcycles shared cars uh, and then at the bottom kind of other motorized modes so so private cars really at the bottom we, we need to be encouraging all of the other forms of transport above this 
Uh, and then we have a number of modal share targets, but I've just highlighted one here. This is the percentage of commuter journeys within Oxford that we want to shift from. It's currently around 25% of journeys within the Oxford city itself. We want to shift to it being 50% of journeys by 2035. So how are we going to do that? Well, we've got four big plans, and then I'll talk about some of the other ones after this, but basically the four big plans for this year and next year are the LTNs on the left-hand side, which have already been introduced. We've got six of them. Three have been approved and are permanent. Three have been recently launched. And then if any of you know Oxford, it's a, it has a number of legacy LTNs. So we have been, uh, if, if you look at our sort of historic LTN map, there are a lot of three roads which have been blocked 20 years ago, 25, 30 years ago. So, um, you know, we, we're looking at having a city that has primary routes going through and, and not being able to cut through um, between main roads. Uh, but those recent LTNs in the east of the city have, in, in my ward, have, have stopped that. Um, and so the second one, this is the bus gates and traffic filters currently in consultation. So these are uh, effectively prioritising um, all modes of transport that are not private cars by allowing them through on the slide, these red dots, these are going to be the bus gates. So buses and taxis will be able to pass unhindered through here. Um, emergency vehicles, blue badge holders, vans, lorries, HGVs in the short term. Uh, and we are just deciding, or it is in consultation as to how many permits residents will get. So at the moment, the plan is 100 permits, which means that two days a week residents would be able to pass through these filters without being charged, without being fined. Um, but any more than that, they would not. Uh, and the, the aim of this infrastructure, these bus gates, is to reduce traffic by 20 percent, 30 percent and increase park and ride uses, make things safer for cyclists and, and walking and speed up bus routes. So that's kind of the, the big thing that, that, that's the next you know, in consultation. We have also a zero emission zone, which is a very small pilot here. You can see in the purple, just in a few streets in Oxford, that the plan is to expand that to charge all cars, all vehicles, which are not zero emissions. Uh, again, that's in consultation at the moment, so we don't have a firm timeline on that. And then finally, um, we have a working place parking levy planned for, for 2023. Um, and that, uh, I believe a couple of other cities are looking at that. That would be any business within our ring road that has more than 11 parking spaces would pay £600 per space per year. Again, the consultation is, is ongoing um, and you know the, the details are, are still being worked out. Um, we're also, uh, and I haven't put that on this slide, looking at other initiatives that, that other cities have mentioned. So for example, 20 miles an hour, we've pulled down to 20 miles an hour across a lot of Oxfordshire recently. Uh, Vision Zero, I mentioned briefly, school streets, uh, and then Voy e-scooters, we're another trial city for them. So happy to, happy to talk about them in a minute. Uh, I'm just gonna quickly run through um, some of the things that I'm doing personally. So I have a background in tech. Uh, I used to head up fashion at eBay and previously I was at private equity at Bain and Company. So I'm interested in business innovation, and there are three projects that I'm involved in, which are not council funded, but are all trying to do the same kind of thing. Uh, one of them is around peer to peer car sharing. So launching shared groups of neighborhoods or community groups or churches or whatever, where people share their own cars, they pull them and share them. Um, we've done one in Blenheim, we've done several in Oxford, uh, various other little Oxford satellite towns, trying to organize community car sharing in order to reduce the need and expense and hassle of car ownership. And also because when people don't own cars, they use them less. Uh, second thing, I'm looking at college delivery. So working with some of the colleges to get all of their posts delivered to a depot out of town uh, and then get them brought in once a day on a cargo bike. And the aim of that is reducing LGVs uh, in the city because obviously LGVs are not as dangerous as HGVs, but still really, really dangerous for cyclists. They often have to park in the cycle lane or they, they do park in the cycle lane. Uh, they cause hazards. We do not have many fully segregated cycle lanes. We have some, but you know, it, the, the amount of and and as we see an increasing trend towards more internet shopping we expect to see more of this so the idea is to see if we can reduce some of this burden in a kind of pragmatic way and um, by working with local stakeholders uh, and the other thing is um the uh, the cable car urban aerial transit so you know just thinking about whether this is is feasible for for a city like oxford i know a couple of other cities in the uk have looked at them obviously one launched in toulouse in may in may this year paris is um launching one in 2025 you know, it, it's not definite, but I think it's thinking about interesting and innovative areas that we could look at to, to solve transport issues. So, you know, this is one of the things we're looking at. Finally, then, uh, one of your questions was how you can help us with our vision for Oxford. So I think there's four key things. Um, 
you know, supporting this economic, this idea that there is economic growth without growth in cars. I mean, we know that the OEMs, the, the original equipment ma manufacturers, are reducing their forecasts for cars. The, the vision is of a future with fewer cars in developed nations than we have at the moment. So um, how can we help drive that narrative? Because there is there is a future without everybody having to have the hassles, expense and and climate destruction of of everybody owning a car that's the first thing the second thing i think really importantly is you know with another new administration coming into come today uh, committing to gear change and to active travel england like it's essential we need um as uh, leads referred to you know it's motivating having these organizations out here to support us we really need them so just that would be the second thing uh, a third point would be to review the potential to subsidise e-bikes, not just EVs. Um, there's proven case studies on this in Europe. It's not very discussed. There's big subsidies on EVs. E-bikes are a game changer. Uh, and really, I think we should be looking to learn not just from the infrastructure of our continental neighbours, but also some of the successful business initiatives such as subsidising e-bikes. Uh, and the fourth thing would be reforming some of the archaic planning laws. So new settlements should be obliged to provide for active travel requirements. It should be a national uh, law if we want if we want to really see active travel. It needs to be in developer legal situ you know legal framework rather than relying on councils to push it. Uh, it, it should be national. Um, and if you wanted a fifth, you could also help do something on pavement parking. But I know that that is already being discussed. So yeah. <laughs> and then just finally, just you know, if you want to come and visit. Like my, my colleagues on the transport cabinet have asked me to extend the invite. I can do a great cycle tour of Oxford. You can reach out to any of us. We're really happy to host anyone that wants to see some of the infrastructure that we're doing, some of the initiatives that we're, that we're running. You know, please, please do get in touch. Thank you. Really, thank you. That was that was great. And thank you for the asks as well. And, and um, knowing that that's come from a cross party coalition doing stuff in a city which has uh, a long history of cycling, um, and uh, but he's but knows it, it can do so much more. Can I just um, pick up the question that was uh, has come in for um, for David at um, Leeds, uh, which is um, in the course of delivering cycle routes, have you had pinch points where you've had to discuss taking space in the carriageway versus sharing a wide footway with people cycling? If so. Did road space reallocation happen? And on the same note, have you installed bus stop bypasses and how have they been received? I think those are uh, important questions um, that a, a lot of us uh, ask. Mm. Yeah, okay. very good questions. I think on the, yes, we, we have done quite extensive road space relocation, um, especially in the city centre and the inner city. Um, I think traditionally we were more so, is, in the, in the the ancient history of, of cycle planning in 2014 you know it's, i think I, things have moved very quickly in other words but it, traditionally would have i think maybe lent more towards shared space at pinch points um but in in the last sort of two to three years we've lent more towards re reallocating carriageway space so that there is um retained delineation between walking and cycling um i think we we only really resort to shared space now as an absolute last resort um when we've reduced the carriageway to the absolute minimum um and it, it's actually it's, you know it's impossible to deliver a, a proper cycling and walking um facility um so now we, we usually our approach now is to always delineate um and on that note yeah we have delivered lots of bus stop bypasses um we've tried various approaches over the years um and we, we're actually it's actually crystallizing into a, a clear policy now um where we're yeah we're seeking to deliver bypasses where we have where, where we have space uh where that um where the shelter is on the on the bypassed area and where we have less space we're, we're seeking to avoid bus stop borders where we can um and always trying to provide some sort of, of landing area for pedestrians um but we we have we have also delivered bus stop borders and, and found that in certain circumstances they can they can they can work our bypasses in the city center and, and on the corridors have actually been fairly fairly well received so far um yeah they seem to be working well um i, I suppose bus use is still recovering from the pandemic and um, so it might be too early to fully evaluate them at this point um but we've they've been well received so far um so yeah really really interesting questions there nice yeah, i mean construction it, 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 detail yeah. as, as you're the officer i guess engineer here today um uh the, uh, 
I think what we all hope one of the key aspects of active travel England will be, which is what the original Cycling England that disappeared in 2010 was starting to do, is, is really build up uh, a, a, a catalogue of good practice and also bad practice so that, you know, not every city and town isn't relearning um, the mistakes or, or no, relearning what others have already been through and had to re-engineer. And I think that's that's really important. So the more uh, people can go and look at or, or in on Zoom see uh, what what works well and what would what doesn't work well. I think that's really important. Um, I wondered, can we now move on to uh, bringing on counselor, re reluctant counselors, and particular success stories um, are, are about what works, and particularly for uh, Emily. I think a lot of of politicians are you saying all our politicians went to Oxford or Cambridge um I mean obviously a lot of politicians did go to Oxford and Cambridge but and, and many others have have visited those cities so do you think those sort of visits and that kind of experience would help politicians understand what's possible in other cities uh, when prioritizing active travel so um let, let, I'll just let me go to Jane um then Adam then David if you feel qualified to talk about councillors um, on the whole issue about councillors and, and, and bringing uh, councillors along. Sorry, not Jane, I meant Emily, I think. Okay, so, so Adam, David and Emily. Want me to come in? Um, yeah, I mean, it is a, it is a challenge. I think um, uh, councillors, um, by their very dint, kind of represent um, the wider community, um, and therefore you find all, you know, kind of all, all views and all levels of engagement there. Um, visiting other places is, is really important. We were kind of uh, very um, in, in, in heartened by having a having a visit from a, from a Danish city a couple of years ago, which uh, made us realise we were probably doing something something right. Um, but within our own, within within my own political group, um, you do have to keep make, making the case, and it is an, it's an ongoing um, an on, ongoing task, um, you know. But the more infrastructure we put in, um, the one we always well, there's two we return to. One is um, uh, taking out a surface level car park and replacing it with a public square. Um, lots of noise before we before we did it. Um, uh, nobody's asking for that car park to be put back in now, and taking out um, a, a flyover. Um, the, the led, led to the um, led to, to the site of the, the biggest Diwali celebration. This side of this side of India um, took that barrier out to create better walking routes. There was all sorts of people going to start the city. We've opened up the city centre to to the Belgrade area of the city. So we can now point with our record to success successful schemes that have um, made the city more livable. Thank you. Um, uh, Emily? Uh. Sure, yeah, I have two comments. Um, firstly, uh, in Oxford, we're lucky enough to have some very strong campaign groups. And for example, one of them paid for over the weekend, or didn't pay over the weekend, it was released over the weekend, a YouGov survey that was independently done on the bus filters. And so, um, and that was two to one in favour, you know, and they, they paid for that and they released the information and we didn't know what it was going to be in advance. But I think we fairly consistently see this pattern that, that actually people support around two to one in favour uh, in terms of residents of local cities generally active travel uh, measures. Now, we have a fairly organised um, group of people opposed. Uh, you see the same names coming up again and again, uh, and they are, are using all of the, the, the kind of the classic uh, methods of, of disrupting and the social media narrative can often be fairly negative. But the fact is that if you show councillors consistently the data that comes through and if you show um, other decision makers how it's worked in other places and you know I know Ipsos Mori did a survey on LTNs I think Manchester and Birmingham were in that and actually there's, there is a lot of data out there that shows people are very supportive of active travel and councillors should be good enough to understand that it's it's about data. It's not just about listening to loud voices, and and many are. Uh, and so I think that's been fairly effective in Oxford. Is that just showing people the data, uh, showing people how how consultations are responded to. The second thing is that yes, we did, as many other people um, mentioned, go out and and 
consult locally. There was a lot of consultation happening. A lot of cons- councillors consulted in their local areas. Uh, and, and we do see, as you do in other cities, that residents of the new local low traffic neighbourhoods are more in favour and people that are used to driving through the low traffic neighbourhoods are less in favour. And you would expect that. Um, and it's fairly consistent. But again, showing councillors you know, analogues of what's happened in other cities is is helpful because actually the narrative that, um, for example, uh, all of a certain group are opposed just isn't true. Often you may see certain groups that are a bit more opposed, but but still, there's still a lot of people that, that do support active travel because it, okay. it, it, we know, you know. Um, and, and finally, the other thing I would say is it's useful to have people visit other cities but actually having people from other cities visit you is even more helpful because it's easier to get a group of councillors together if you're having someone come from Waltham Forest or you know in the UK or, or any of the other places uh, that, have, that have done this successfully or to have people come from Ghent you know like video conference in or you know Ljubljana we had someone from Ljubljana recently I mean you guys know this right they they made the whole centre car free to opposition and it's now 97% of residents love it. You know, there there are ways of getting groups of councillors together to see and understand data so that it's not just a few loud voices that they hear. Um, Yeah, that would be my... And and, and I think think that's been borne out in local elections that uh, actually campaigning against active travel actually doesn't benefit the the, the party that's campaigning against, you know, doing that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, um, I'm, I'm conscious there's one other uh, question, but it, it's, it's um, I mean, just a quick answer. Uh, and I, again, I'll give David a chance because it's a slightly engineering question. Um, do the COVID temporary schemes teach us anything about doing things quickly and cheaply? If so, shouldn't a city zone or, or, city, or zone wide approach to car free routes be prioritised by banning through? traffic to, and motor traffic uh, uh, well as opposed to segregated route through routes um, I'm not sure I quite understand the question if not no don't worry I'm not if I don't understand the question I can attempt to uh, I mean in attempting a comment I mean I I think in in, Le- in, in Leeds we've attempted we've we've um, supported both approaches um, I think given the size of Leeds and the fact that our highways are maybe s- somewhat wider than than many of the highways in, in Oxford, we, we do have space to reallocate space to create segregated routes. Um, also, a lot of our major routes, it's, it's hard to completely uh, reassign through traffic from our major radial and orbital roads. So cyclists and motor vehicles um, therefore need their own space, but that doesn't preclude um, filtering neighbourhoods alongside those major routes. So I, I wouldn't, I think I think both are key, key planks of our approach. I think on, on the COVID measures, it did show that you can achieve a lot of the benefits with with not much funding, particularly on the lengths where one door, because we found have been very effective. There's some some maintenance issues, but they, they can be really good. I think junctions are harder to do to do well with uh, with small budgets, yeah. as yeah. I made it point earlier. Yeah, um, but even even there, you, you can you can deliver a good amount of benefit even with interim measures. You know, with um, yeah changes to junction kind of signal phasings and, and well, things like that. Okay, I'm going to have to wrap up and, and let Selene Saxby say a few words, but thank you very much to all of our speakers and um, uh, Adam and Jack here, this Adam and Jack, um, uh, are going to, uh, to capture the key points and will circulate that. Um, pick, what I picked up is peer-to-peer car share. It's what I do, uh, was what we do as, as a household, we, we share with the neighbours, but there's no way of that capturing that. I, nobody would ever ask you, do you peer-to-peer car share? Maybe we ought to think about how we pick up that as an option in stats um, and subsidizing e-bikes. But also, you know, I, th- I, I, I think we have to, we need a simple, this is personally speaking, I think we need a simple subsidy scheme rather than cycle to work, which is no use if you're not actually in work and have a job. Um, and uh, points taken about reforming planning rules and across the house, Strong uh, a pavement parking ban is is very much supported. Okay, Selene, would you like? I know you've been very busy today, so would you like to just say just a few remarks to? Thank you, um, Ruth. Thank you for holding the floor. My apologies for not being with you throughout. 
um, as an MP that doesn't even have a city in their constituency. It's always um, insightful to hear what can be done when you do have a city. And I, I very much hope that some of the learnings from today, we can filter down because actually that's how we deliver active travel for the whole country um, is for towns like Barnstable, um, which have struggled to find solutions in some places, partly because our roads are very dinky um, but <laughs> and it costs an awful lot to put bridges across all the rivers that we've got. It's, it's, it's a, an ongoing challenge um, for anyone following, but thank you all for your contributions. It's it's really great to be here and um, hopefully after today be back to um, some level of normality in the active travel space. Um, so our next meeting is going to be on Monday the 21st of November at 4.30pm um, and hopefully see lots of you then and we are off on a study tour on the 27th of November to Waltham Forest, timings to be confirmed. So lots going on in this space and thank you all for all your hard work and for the team here for putting this on this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks very much, everybody.